Uh, Dr. Cameron Mirza is here visiting with us from uh, Loyola, where he's been for the last 18 years. He is an associate professor of pathology and medical medicine, medical education, and applied health sciences at Loyola. He serves as the assistant dean for DEI at the Institute School of Medicine, the vice chair of education and academic affairs in the department. Um, also as the program director for the Heathcroft Fellowship and is the founding program director for the MS program in medical laboratory science. He also runs course, courses in the medical school um, and is the director of the medical school. He graduated with academic distinction and was a recipient of the Ravaz Gold Medal uh, from Atchison College in Lahore, Pakistan. He then completed medical school at Dr. Khan University in Pakistan in 2003. Completed his PhD work um, under the under Professor Azrar Malik um, at USC and stayed at USC University of Chicago, um, where he completed residency with the president and started or uh, continued his award winning career that has been going since then um, as a pathologist in training. He did a fellowship in EPAP and thoracic pathology and completed a fellowship in medical education research at the University of Chicago. Um, he has continued to be an award winning educator and mentor, um, crossing many state lines, national borders. All I think any student um, has been impacted by Dr. Merza and his reach, um, as well as his passion for building the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Who has uh, for spirit of the community um, that really now embraced with us during COVID? I think we will hear about this in this obscure title we have here uh, today. So we're very thankful to host Dr. Mirza, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to where we can like. Can everyone hear me in the back? I don't think the microphone is working. I don't think so. I think I just have a loud voice. Better? Okay. Can, it's working now? Is that okay? Okay. All right. Is that, oh, is that better? Okay, good. Okay. Excellent. You might just have to stay next. That's fine. Yeah. I'm okay. All right. Okay. Uh, it is such an honor to be here. Um, the most stressful part of any presentation is the introduction because I have an out of body experience when someone is talking about me. I'm so grateful for the invitation. Um, it's my first time in Alabama and it's been an incredible over 24 hours already. And I look forward to the rest of them. I am passionate about pathology education. And as many of you know, I'm a hematopathologist, but today's talk will be on education. And I thought that it would be a good idea to share with you some of the things that we've been doing in pathology education, and maybe perhaps to challenge everyone to think outside the box when it comes to pathology education, how it's changing. And just to be very pretentious, I threw in the word bricolage in there. I did not know about this word. And I asked Chad GPT to come up with like a really cool title for a talk. And uh, I said that, you know, and I kind of gave it a good prompt and it put this word bricolage in there. And I had to Google what that means. So I'm not really a horrible nerd person, but I will, I will tell you the meaning of bricolage right at the end. So please don't think I'm super pretentious. It was meant to be a joke. All right. So Medical education uh, in this country is changing. Actually, around the world is changing. Let me just see if it's moving forward. So we know that medical education is changing. There's a certain number of factors for that. One is that there's a lot of pressure to reduce the first two years of education so that there's more time to transition to practice uh, in residency, right? And in pathology, that comes with a price. And the price is that we know that preclinical education is where pathology is taught. In many institutions, it's not even taught as pathology. It's given some other name, right? And as we're looking at, at the pathways to pathology, and even not trying to make people pathologists, even if we're asking them to make an informed decision about their life choices, about whether they do pathology or not, um, what is happening is that they're not necessarily seeing the value of pathology. Concurrently, uh, what we are seeing is that in these two recent articles, there are words that are popping up, right? Telepathology, digital pathology, artificial intelligence and education. Um, and I think that as pathology is changing and 
I see that the only silver lining that the pandemic gave was that we were forced as educators to think outside the box about how we educate our trainees. And so are there lessons that we can learn and things that we can take forward post pandemic to, to continue and continue to change the way medical education is done? Because historically, medical education in this country is very much Flexnerian, right? And so if you know about uh, Flexner, he was a, a researcher and educator in 1910 at the Carnegie Foundation. And he, rumor has it, went on horseback or in a carriage and visited 155 medical schools and came up with some conclusions and recommendations. At the time, his notice was that there's substandard medical education, that the, there should be a minimum of high school education before uh, and two years of college before medical school, that medical school should be four years long with two years of basic sciences, and then proprietary schools should be closed or incorporated into universities. And so this two plus two model was really very flexnerian. As a result of this, at the time, 89 medical institutions closed and the number of physicians decreased from 173 in 100,000 to 125, right? With this idea that, quote, there should be fewer but better physicians. I'm the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Loyola. And I have to tell you that we talk about Flexner Report, you know, because it's basically the foundation of how education is done right now. However, the racist legacies and implications of how this marginalized, already marginalized community communities for education are incredible. And I could spend a whole hour talking about the impact that this had specifically for historically black medical schools. Sadly, that's not the topic of conversation today, so I'm not going to talk about it, but I can't talk about Flexner without mentioning this aspect of um, uh, the Flexner report. In any case, as time moved on, because of the Flexner report, fewer physicians had been made. But by 1959, there was a there was a shortage, right? The fewer physicians led to a shortage. And then ultimately at that time, the Bain report came out and they, we had to increase the number of medical, uh, the, the way medical students were and the number of institutions perhaps by a few. And But the model of education for pathology did not change. And now the way we are reforming medical education, uh, which is written by Dr. Emanuel here is in twofold. And I'll highlight these two areas. One is that they, we should have training in operations management and process improvement, and that there should be less preclinical training in basic sciences. When I think of training in operations management and process improvement, I think of pathology. Why can't pathology champion that aspect of medical education? But this is juxtaposed to the fact that there will be less preclinical training in basic sciences. And apart from a few medical schools that have longitudinal curricula for pathology, many of our institutions just stop pathology education entirely after two years. So what are the changes being proposed? Well, reduce training to no more than 15 months. This is preclinical training, right? So that is the time where you have pathology in there uh, and include training in operations and encourage pursuit of specialty specific degrees kind of early on. I have no beef with the later two, but the top one I think can be an issue. Because I think as a field, I'm not sure why, pathologists have given up this idea that we are a clinical specialty, right? Clinical correlation is advised. We are clinicians. It is our own consultation that is advised. That is what we need to do. So this idea that you know we have to think outside the box of how pathology is taught, myself and many educators around the country have thought about many things. At Loyola University Chicago Street School of Medicine, I have talked about a vertical curriculum make it all four years, we will talk about pathology, similar to the threads that you have at UAB. But they said no. I've talked about a, uh, a, a curriculum concurrent to radiology. When you have radiology, you know what, they're talking about mammograms, and I will show them breast pathology, right? Just give me another hour, tack pathology on, but there's no time for that. Within surgery, right? Give me a day when they're on surgery that they follow the specimen, comes come frozen sections, and I will try and come up with a way to supplement that in their surgery rotation. There's no time for that. Or within medicine, right? Let me talk to your residents or medical students about laboratory medicine and the CBCs that they order and the CMPs that they order and the infectious workups that they do. Medicine, I have to say, still provided me some flexibility, but otherwise, all these educators are so stuck with time and their own GME, LCME guidelines that they really don't value pathology the way it can be valued. 
And the problem is that, you know, when we try and make a case for a universal clerkship, and I'm just showing you these letters and things that I've, in my frustration, tried to do, that's just me sitting with a medical student posing for this picture, um, is that the case for universal clerkship is difficult because pathology departments don't have the bandwidth for every single medical student to come through. Theoretically, every single medical student should come through because they would become better physicians. I was talking to someone earlier today during one of my chats, and at Stretch, despite the fact that we have many passionate pathology educators, we find that medical students can leave and graduate, matriculate without even knowing where the pathology department is, right? The physical location isn't important, but the idea that they don't know, like they, they can order thousands of studies on their patients and they don't know where pathology is. Mix this now with the fact that step one is pass fail, right? Think about this. The fact that they used to have this stress, like pressure cooker stress for step one scores because they wanted to do orthopedics, but they studied pathology as a result of that, right? So what are the implications now that the USMLE step one has become pass or fail? Is that better for pathology because they're reading pathology without that pressure cooker on their head? Maybe they like it more, but step one studying isn't the practice of pathology, right? Dr. McCleskey and I were in one of her classes yesterday and we brought up this idea that in, in education, they see us as educators, but they don't see us as physicians because they don't see us signing out our cases. They don't see us doing patient care. But in any case, so this, so this has now pushed step one stress into step two, right? That's where the, you know, they've just kicked the can in many ways. So while I'm happy that there's no pressure for step one, I think, and we've written about the fact that there are implications for pathology programs for this too. So we start, when we started, when I started this education journey in pathology, I thought it would be a great idea to understand learning styles of our trainees. This has been done in every single subspecialty of medicine before, but pathologists had never been looked at. And we considered multiple models, right? Whether it is pedagogy, which is content-centered, or you can think of andragogy, which is learner-centered, right? And so there are multiple ways of evaluating how learning styles are. And the way to do this is to perhaps look at Kolb's learning styles. Kolb's learning styles, sorry, this is not moving forward. There we are. There are four learning styles. So you have diverging, assimilating, converging, and accommodating, right? And this is the way students or trainees perhaps learn better, right? And so the idea is that whether they're learning by observation, learning by thinking, learning by doing, or learning by experience. And so I wish we had time to go through this in detail, but we uh, we looked at a lot of students and we found that our medical students typically learn mostly by assimilating. And when they become residents, we know there's a sharp learning curve in pathology residency. That assimilating comes down to a little bit more converging and actually it becomes more tactile. Interestingly, when we also looked at our fellows and our faculty, they're very similar and they go back to an assimilating style. So it's interesting when residency, the learning style is different. But the reason this is important is because can we create for our medical students or for our GME trainees ways in which we are adapting our, learn, our teaching styles to their learning styles, right? That would be the, the high goal, right? To be able to do that. Yeah, all right. So the learning styles as given here are that, for example, there it's a spectrum. So no, no one will have a specific type of style. It'll be somewhere on the spectrum. So for example, if you are learning by experience, that is using more visual cues, right? If that is a mixture with, let's say, observation, where you're observing and you are using experience, the style of your learning will be diverging, right? It's just... Um, I would say like an, it's not digital, it's like an analog way to assess what type of learner you are. We're all different learners. Some of us used to rewrite, like, you know, doodle on a page or some people would visualize things better or some people needed to perhaps go do an experiment. And so that's the mechanism of the different types of learning styles. The words by themselves are not that important. So, but what I was trying to get to at that time was that if you're trying to get a higher, um, objective of trying to, let's say, individualize learning, what medical students have done is that they have already outsourced and self-directed their own learning. We have some students here. I'm not going to uh, not going to put them under the spot. But the idea is that medical students in general have outsourced much of their pathology education. We've seen this in our own institutions. If things are not mandatory, they don't come to lectures. They are paying for outside resources. 
and you know whether it be Potoma or Sketchy or Osmo, whatever it is, right? And these places are doing great jobs in educating them. So what is the value of us in medical school, at least for the first two years of medical school? What's the value that we're providing them? What's the value of us explaining pathology to them if we aren't able to interest them in making an informed decision about pathology, they're not attending our lectures, but they're attending these resources that are free. How do we consider pedagogy with all of this in mind? Do we ignore it? Many institutions just ignore it. They say, oh, we don't want to talk about what they're doing, but your students are doing it, right? And so how do you, how do you take the next step forward? Typically when you have good ideas, and we all have good ideas. It takes a long time and lots of planning based on LCME to implement a change in medical school, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens typically is that you have to expect delays. And this is what was happening to us as well. We decided before the pandemic, we thought we were so cool. Let's do some asynchronous stuff. No one is coming to class. There are only 10 people sitting in the classroom. Many of our clinicians are super busy, so they didn't want to come and spend the hour. So we were trying to flip the classroom, something you guys do really well here. And we were trying to come up with a module that would be half online and half hybrid, half whatever, right? This was before the pandemic. And it was taking a long time. I have to tell you that I think it took two years thinking about it. And it was 2019 when we were finalizing how to put one module, which was pulmonary, online. And guess what? Boom. We had to put the entire thing online the next year, right? And so I, I think that in, in a way, I'm proud of medical educators that they had to think on their feet and, you know, be on their toes and come up with a new mechanism. But it really, it discouraged me that we were waiting for years and years to make a change. And then obviously, uh, international pandemic made us do it. But it really spoke to me because I think that there are mechanisms now that we can learn some strategies from the past, where, for example, if our students are thinking of didactic, rote learning, where no one is attending lectures, not seeing the pathologist as a physician, so could the pandemic in that sense be that line in the sand after which the students think of pathology in an active student-centered learning environment, which is digital and interactive, and hopefully they see the pathologists as physicians as well. So I think some of that, that is happening. I think that we've been able to explore multiple uh, avenues of advocacy. We the, the, the virtual factor has been able to expand our footprint in a way that we had never thought before. You know, even in my like household, my parents are in Pakistan. I never Zoomed with them ever, ever. And like now all of a sudden in the pandemic, I was like, you know, guys, we can set up a Zoom meeting. And my sister is in a different place and I'm in a different place and we all Zoom together. I had that Zoom account for years. I didn't even know that the medical school had a Zoom account before the pandemic. And so we started, like even our personal communications became different. And so I think that in order to kind of stay ahead of the game, you have to think outside the box. And so I'm gonna give you some examples of how we've used social media to supplement learning. If there's some social media haters here, just pause for a second. Let me let me be done and I'm happy to take the hate afterwards, okay? But social media is here to stay. You can't hide from it, right? It's there. All of our learners, especially our younger learners, are on it. And so are there mechanisms that it has changed the way we acquire information, how we engage and we network? The answer is yes. And actually, the way we educate has completely changed as well. And the two questions that need to be answered for this are to see whether teachers are on social media. Answer is yes. And are students on social media? Answer is yes. So it now becomes the world of hashtag meded, right? This online ability to learn and to teach. And many of us are doing this. Question is, how can we use this to change the future of how pathology is either taught or pathology is understood or the advocacy for pathology? So, you know, it used, to, I'm very, um, you know, I, I have an old school mindset. I'm a geriatric millennial. And so I think that for me, uh, you know, cell phone use during sign out was a no, no, I really despised it, but I'm finding that our residents or our students can find things on the fly, like right there, because they can find something pretty quickly. And so I myself had to learn some lessons about how to be open-minded with this. But if you think about the online world, and I'm giving you the example of Twitter or X, but this could be Instagram, this could be TikTok, this could be Snapchat, it could be whatever, any platform, any web-based platform. 
all of the things that we do in academic centers for education are happening on those platforms. They are being used in university, research, teaching, community settings. There is free online accessible medical education. The pathology community is pretty active. Many of you I know are part of it. There are laboratory experts across subspecialties that are that are teaching. And these, you know, these are not like quacks. These are people we know from excellent institutions who have rigorous ways of doing pathology. So this isn't like just generic like people like, you know, it's not fake news. Let's put it that way. There are journal clubs that are happening, often with the first author of the of the paper that are happening online. We are celebrating cool education with an award. There are many research collaborations that are happening on through this. People tweet from national conferences, and sometimes you don't even have to be at the conference. You will get to know what's, what was cool and what was happening just by watching the tweets. And in many ways, at least that's what I'm here to kind of propose, is that all of that can be converted into a language that our promotion committees can see, and that is to convert this all into scholarly activity, right? Because without that, we're not really getting anywhere in academia. I'll give you some examples of Twitter homework and path elective, hopefully, and then I'll talk about the Digital Communications Fellowship in Pathology, and uh, lastly, end with like some podcast stuff and some inter-professional, like inter-collaborative, interdisciplinary uh, things. So it's not just in pathology or in medicine. This is, you know, in science. Uh, you know, even though they are worried, scientists are worried that they're going to be scooped. The, you know, data is being presented. It is now your your social media footprint is part of your brand. It is part of your laboratory's brand. It is part of your uh, if it is part of your uh, departmental brand. This has become even more important after the pandemic because many of our younger trainees are looking at these resources to try and figure out what an institution represents. So medical education in X, I would say that there's direct access to expert knowledge, right? Dr. Bobby Pritt, one of the world's best parasitologists at Mayo, she posts her cases. I'll show you one of them. I have direct access to her. I could even probably DM her and ask a question. She's probably very busy to answer, but you know, I mean, I could at, le at least I could try. It's a broad community. We know pathology in general is broad. Like there's so many subspecialties, but pretty much every one of them is uh, is represented there. There is a lot of networking. There are many papers that are written by people who've never met in person. They've only met because they had shared educational uh, experiences or you know kind of vision. Uh, flattened hierarchies. You know you can write to the dean of an institution. You can tweet to the president of a country if you wanted to. And I think that in many ways, it's a, it's a mechanism to enact change and hopefully even change perceptions to how pathologists are. So Anas Nasser is a biomedical scientist uh, in the UK. He is uh, the equivalent of like a medical laboratory professional here. Uh, he has a hashtag morphology Monday and he shows some blood smears, which you know are always interesting. Here's the example of Dr. Bobby Pritt. This is an old case, it's number 580. I think she's on case 700 and something. You know, this is a Demodex folliculorum. I did not know what this necessarily was. I have learned parasitology, even though that is not my interest at all. I call social media feed CME light. I can just go through them and I'm like, wow, this is pretty incredible. I've learned something new. I learned something new about heme path. I, I wouldn't be exaggerating if I say every day, right? Yesterday, Dr. Sibal Hussain posted an incredibly cool case of nodal presentation of hairy cell leukemia. And I was like, this is pretty cool. I've never seen it in real life. And those things, you know, the entire case is there for me to and everyone to learn from. Doesn't have to be mind bogglingly cool things. This is Juliet Smith. She's showing you what straw colored means when you think of platelet units. Straw could be kind of darker, straw could be lighter. And it's a nice way to talk about simple stuff. This was a case of leishmaniasis that I saw when I was rotating at a pediatrics hospital. And, uh, you know, it always like made me pause when I started in practice because, you know, when I, I have to be honest, like the first few times I looked at marrows, I was like, are those megas with platelets or is it leishmaniasis? Like, you know, it was just, it's just crazy how like it changed my brain, but it ha doesn't have to be crazy cases. It can be, you know, simple, straight. This is old, a tweet from 2019. It shows you, you know, hemoglobin SC. But for me, the Twitter camaraderie and interprofessional education has been amazing. This is a feed I'm showing you from my DMs in, on Twitter, where in 2019, I asked a couple of individuals in medical laboratory science to 
see whether they want to put an educational project together and submit it to a meeting. In early in July, the, that was how we put it together. And at the end, as a congratulations message, because it was accepted, I ended up meeting these people in real time, real person for the first time when we were presenting together. And I'm just showing this to you as a concrete example of how these types of collaborations happen. You could argue that, well, and it would be true. You would say that, well, you know, this is kind of superficial, right? You only have 250 characters and it's like an echo chamber where the same people are talking about the same things. But I think that there are ways that we can expand upon that, right? It isn't meant to replace proper learning in a August kind of didactic environment. But I think that there are mechanisms to a tutorial is one way to do it. A tutorial is a thread of, you know, tweets that are put together that, you know, join together a story. There, there is a hematologist by the name of Dr. David Steensma. Please follow him. His hematology tweet stories are incredible. I have learned more about the history of hematology just because of his tutorials. And I'm a hemopath. Like I thought I was trained really well, but I didn't know some things. I mean, it's incredible. So I think that you should definitely follow that. But Journals and the way we measure impact factor has changed as well. We know that impact factor, old school impact factor is different. There are all metrics now. The number of times the paper is tweeted, the number of times the paper is put, put on LinkedIn is all new. And as a result of this, I'm specifically showing you journals that are not pathology that have social media editor positions. I served as a social media editor for two pathology journals till recently. And part of it was to understand how we can maximize the impact of those articles online, because that is pretty much what the model is. How many of our younger learners are still reading the, the journals? Many of our institutions have completely made online journals now. And so if you go to papers, you will find a little alt metric tab and you can click it and it'll tell you it's been tweeted by this many people, it's been read by this many people and all of that, uh, it becomes pretty apparent. We are giving awards, awards in a way that, you know, it's pretty easy to do. You can always go to a tweet, think it's educational and hashtag uh, a path tweet award. Here, Dr. Cox is giving a path tweet award to Kevin Kwan. And, you know, this is a mechanism. There's like a, there's a, there's a quarterly kind of uh, condensation of these. And then there's a panel of judges. And at USCAP, we give like a, it's like a grassroots thing, which is like a printed certificate, but it's always a fun way to establish, you know, celebrating uh, people who've been, uh, who've been teaching. For me, I've used this, these platforms to kind of expand my educational footprint. It was just something I'm passionate about. I don't get reimbursed for any of this. All my teaching is free. I'm probably the worst businessman on earth, but that's okay. Uh, you know, Knowledge In Knowledge Out is another website. I have lectures on histology, uh, basics of heme, all of the stuff that are basic lectures that I would probably start my residents out with or my medical students. And they have access to these lectures pretty much any time. And the interesting thing about numbers on web platforms is that these numbers accrue. A lot of people are watching these videos. Many of you know Dr. Uh, Jared Gardner, and he's a dermatopathologist. He has a YouTube channel, and he was a very big inspiration for me when I started the heme education that I do. And recently, Jared and I, you know, and I texted back and forth, and he said that my YouTube hours of education are more than the number of hours that I have been alive. Think about that for a second. He has a number of YouTube hours that have been viewed. That his life, number of hours at that point, it has surpassed the number of hours he has been alive on this earth. That is incredible. Talk about legacy stuff, right? You are basically teaching when you are in the bathroom, when you are studying, when you are sleeping, when you're eating, when you're with your kids, your educational videos are always on. And I think that there's something pretty spectacular about the power of that and to think about how we can leverage that for good. But for the academics in the room, if you're not convinced, let me give you some more examples, journal clubs happening online. And not only are these journal clubs that, you know, you, these are not the journal clubs that you fall asleep to at noon hour, right? These are different. You can basically, you can have 
let's say, you know, there's a first author publication, the individual is on social media, I will interact with them and say, hey, do you want to be part of this Twitter chat? So we will chat about your paper, there will be five questions and people will participate. Hundreds of people come into these Twitter chats, okay? We elevated that by using a voice-based platform. We use Clubhouse, but you can use Twitter spaces. And that is a mechanism, you can see the some faces here, you can have experts from all around the country come and discuss the paper too. That's amazing. We were tweeting about the paper. We were chatting about the paper. It was an incredible hour or 45 minutes. And then I, you know, I was like, well, we have to publish this because if I don't publish it, my dean and my chair won't understand what I did, right? And so we published it and called it Elevating Twitter-Based Journal Club Discussions by Leveraging a Voice-Based Platform. Sounds like a great paper. It's just an okay paper, but it's a paper that explains to you how you can do this as well. Right, So it doesn't always have to be the New England Journal of Medicine. No offense to people who love NEJM. I love it too. But it doesn't have to always be like that. So I think that you know my journey here started with Twitter homework. I was, this was before the pandemic. I am the director of the pathology elective. And I found that even though we could put the medical students day in a beautiful thing of like morning lecture, uh, some preview, then sign out, then lunch, and then another maybe lecture, and then even then, I felt that we couldn't give them the same cool experience of like seeing patients, right, which they do on the wards. So I wanted to find a way to fill in the gaps of their, you know, where they're sitting and doing nothing. And so I thought, hey, let's let's try social media, right? And so the idea was to give them Twitter homework. It was simple. They create a Twitter account. They tweet or retweet one pathology-related thing every day to make sure that it's compliant with patient safety standards and HIPAA and, you know, to credit all original sources to tag it with my handle so that I can know that they've done it, to enjoy themselves and this was not compulsory and did not affect their grade. And if, for example, they did not want their face or name to be on social media, no problem. They could be path student one, two, three and put a picture of a microscope. I didn't care about them actually representing themselves. The response was incredible. These students started finding pathology related material online, but they also started taking pictures of cool things that they were doing. These are old tweets. But they're amazing. Many of these people now are senior residents in pathology programs, and I know about them because they all came through my elective. We now have a virtual elective as well. We have 30, 40 students coming in for a virtual elective. We use all of this supplemented information to supplement their in-person, like kind of their, their learning, which is happening departmentally. I'll go through this pretty quickly, but this paper was published back in 2020. And you know, we asked students who use Twitter, which are on the right, versus who did not use Twitter who are on the left, whether what they learned during the pathology elective would be useful for their future career. It doesn't matter what they were doing. You can see that the people on the right, 80% said strongly agree. We asked them if it increased their medical knowledge. We asked them if, they, if it exposed them to reliable pathology education material. 82, 88%, all of them are agreeing, right? Compared to the people who are not using Twitter. We asked if it was a burden for them to post uh, on Twitter during their rotation, 94% said no. We asked if Twitter took valuable time away from their other educational activities and 94% said no. We asked uh, students who use Twitter whether um, it increased their knowledge of the role of pathology in the lab or pathologists and 82% said yes. And interestingly, 60% of those who were not using Twitter also said yes, because guess what? They were looking at their friends using Twitter and getting jealous that they're not using Twitter. Really, it was a thing. We asked them how many times they you, uh, tweeted a day and I had asked them one time and the majority was just once. We asked them if they had had an adverse or unpleasant experience with posting on Twitter homework. 72% strongly disagreed, 23% disagreed and the rest were neutral. So nobody had a negative experience. And we asked them if Twitter changed their perspective on pathology and in many cases they said yes, positively. In 2019, and this is just the data from the paper, we've continued uh, Twitter homework. There were only 37 elective students in that year. Now we typically have 20 to 30 students a month. They tweeted 527 times, and this led to 78,000 impressions on social media. But we went into data gathering from that, from Simpler hashtag project, and we found that those tweets had been retweeted by 810 students over 3,000 times and led to 6.3 million impressions. And you can say, oh, you know, what are impressions? It's just, it's just th that material is showing up on so someone's social media feed. And I understand it's not like a cool number to look at, but look at the power that this thing holds. 
It was all across the world. People were tweeting and retweeting from across the world. The numbers in this particular thing were not high, but we saw this over and over again. Month to month, we would have a million impressions, 700,000 impressions. And it's pretty amazing. We were able to publish on this in a peer reviewed journal, right? Article about our experience with Twitter homework. And it did not stop. The challenges and opportunities were looked at in multiple papers, right? People looked at different platforms, different ways of doing it, different ways to supplement education. And ultimately, when the pandemic happened, I think we had been primed. We had been primed to be in a position where we can change pathology education because it was not happening in person. So when the pandemic happened, I decided, I mean, we couldn't do a pathology elective anymore. That's it. So all that we were doing in person had to stop. So as I was driving home one day, this is kind of February 2020 and things were starting to shut down. I wondered if we can just make the elective online, right? We had thought about this for pulmonary. So I called one of my M1 medical students. His name is Cullen. Cullen is now a PGY1 resident at UCLA. And I said, Cullen, do you, um, do you know how to make a website? And he said, Dr. Mirza, no, I don't. Cullen and I were supposed to do a funded project over the summer and the fund had been taken away and he had to go home. Like, you know, M1 was on, on, online. So I said, you know what? Let's figure this out. Let's figure out how to make a website and create, uh, and I'm going to use all of the resources that we have on social media and crowdsource this website. In June of 2020, we created pathelective.com. These are the co-founders, many of whom have already spoken at your, at your conferences. So you, you're familiar with them, but that's Cullen with me up on top. So you go to pathelective.com and you have two main arms. It's all modular. It's entirely free. There's an AP arm and a CP arm. If you see AP, these are all the different types of subspecialties that you would enjoy. And this is the CP arm. You have you know, blood bank and transfusion and coagulation, et cetera. So I'll give you an example of pediatric path. So the course leader for pediatric pathology is Dr. Michael Arnold. He's in Colorado and he has Dr. Nolan Maloney and Dr. McKay who helps him. There's a course description, you know, there's some technical help and some disclaimers for legalese. Then I had asked all of our directors to give me a cool video introducing their module because I wanted medical students to know how cool we are. So he's making everyone jealous by being in the mountains of Colorado and that was great. But we kept it simple. There are three lessons in pediatric pathology. They are pediatric tumors, placental pathology, and Hirschsprung disease. Simple. So when you click into one, so let's say you click into pediatric tumors, you have an objective list, a to-do list, and you start on the top left there. I've just like put all of it together on one slide, but there's a pre-assessment. So you take the pre-assessment, and then after that, we've partnered with Path Presenter, and then there's a series of unknown slides. So it's an honor system. The medical student yeah. goes through the unknown slides. There's a, there's a supplementary table where you can find like particular things. So for example, the cartilage plate or the growth plate or whatever. And then after that, you watch a YouTube video, which Dr. Arnold has made as an explanation of all of those unknown slides. After that, you move to some cases, which are typically malignancy cases. And so there are five cases. You do them as unknowns. Again, it's an honor system. There's some questions that we give them, the students. And then after that, Dr. Arnold explains all of this and what the tumors mean. And then there's a post-assessment. And after you do the post-assessment, you get a certificate in the mail. So congratulations, you guys all just completed basics of thoracic pathology. And this, for some reason, this certificate is just a PDF. It means nothing, it's just an honor system. But people love it, it gamifies it. They adore it, We, you know, it's just incredible to me. And I have to say that I have data on who uses a uh, path elective and PGY1 residents love it because medical students may or may not be concerned about that stuff, but the basics of PD path in three lessons with an expert talking about it, just love it. I have to tell you that one of the best feelings I have is when people don't know that I've, I made path elective and now they're rotating in my department. And as I cross by them in the residence room, they have path elective open. And that's amazing. That's amazing that they're just looking at a website that is free for everyone across the world. But for the naysayers who are like, well, how does this help you get promoted? Well, how it helps you get promoted is that you convert it into scholarly activity. So this is not a mind blowing paper. It's the implementation and effectiveness of pathelective.com, but there is something to be learned, something that might help direct education in the future. It is a way to tell you that in one, a couple of months, 
where it reached, and this is obviously old now because this is from 2020, it has reached every country in the world with at least one user other than North Korea, Greenland, some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, other than, and, and the Antarctic. Other than that, and actually, can I tell you, okay, so Sarah Jiang, one of the co-founders, she's amazing. She's a cytopathologist at Duke. She was doing a, a, an excursion, a cruise in the Antarctic. And she said that if she got internet experience, like there, she will just log into Battle Active so that we get the one person. But the internet was like $5,000 or something. So she didn't do it. But uh, but really, it would have been really cool that we got one hit from Antarctica. Anyway, we didn't do that. <laughs> the paper has all of this data, but I can tell you that it's really, really helpful. You can see that where the traffic sources are, where the popular content is, where the students are coming from. We can ask them their level of training. This is how I found out that most of them are residents their interest in pathology, how they found path elective, the engagement with courses, we can figure out whether they're doing more AP and CP, we can figure out which courses are more popular, which ones they're leaving earlier. All If I had a team of people, I would have so much data, but it's just me and Cullen, okay? So we can't really get to a lot of data, but we did build in a mechanism to get feedback. And so here, their experience, their satisfaction, and so for this, five is on the left and it's the highest score. And you can see that everything is skewing towards the left. So that's all good news. We hit 1 million views at ASCAP. This was a website that two novice amateur people who've never made a website before crowdsourced from people they knew on Twitter. One point to this was from like two nights ago. I, I just, I updated the slide. So it's, we have, literally a day we get like over a thousand people coming into the site it's spurring on its own i haven't even looked at the site for like months now we've updated a few modules 162,000 unique visitors in the last couple of months and overall 1.2 million views right that was much more than i would have ever anticipated would happen so i'm pretty proud of that so we now published a second paper this just came out i think last month and in it now, for the educators and the people who look for the data, I have data for every single aspect behind the scenes. I can tell you the attrition. I can tell you which ones are being watched more, what is happening when they're dropping off, how many people are dropping off. You can perfect pedagogy by cause of the fact that you have all of the background data. And I have the pre and the post. I can tell you how they're doing pre and post and which ones need more improvement, I could go back to educate, if I have the bandwidth, I could go back to educators, ask them to fix minute number 11 because that's where people are dropping off. And you could really do a lot with it. So the Association of Pathology Chairs, which you're probably very familiar with, was interested in this product. And actually last year, the Path Elective website became an official publication of the Association of Pathology Chairs. And the founders and the faculty all became part of a committee, which is now the Path Elective Committee. We have over 5,000 Twitter followers and it just continues to grow. And I'm very proud of it. And I think it's a free, you know, people from across the world, especially resource poor countries have reached out to us and told us that this is the only pathology material that they have. There's one place in Pakistan, which I visit often and I help them with pathology cases. They did not know what hematogones were for the hemopaths in the room. They would send their post-treatment BLL kids to hospice because they didn't recognize that hematogone hyperplasia was there and they thought that this was just disease. And these kids were going into hospice when they were just freaking normal, okay? So those people now know if they have access to the internet that they could potentially come to a site like this. And while we never claim that we're giving them medical education, there are places that really need this. So if you think about the inclusivity of how website-based education, which is free, can be. The next paper that is coming out now is the, the equity of educational resources that are free like this. And that data we have and hopefully we'll publish soon. We didn't stop there in the last couple of minutes. I will say that we started a podcast. It's been kind of slow in the last year, but it's called PathBard. Um, please, if you are interested and have literally all the time in the world and you're chilling, yeah, please listen to us. It's actually, there's some very, very fun episodes. Uh, there's one incredible episode with David Feinbaum, which I did. He has Castle, he's a Castleman disease survivor. And uh, that's a clue for the residents. There's a Castleman Jeopardy question later on today. So remember that. 
Um, but I think that we have been able to really leverage uh, technology and remote learning in the era of social distancing. And I think that we cannot really change. We know this. We have to take the lessons that we've learned and take them forward because I think that this will change the way pathology is done. The CAP um, came to us and we did the CAP virtual path series that's available on the CAP website. The first time the pathology match happened uh, in the pandemic, I was like, we have to celebrate these individuals. And so we came up with the hashtag virtual path match and celebrated. These people are all like now fellows or something, right? Or like senior mm -hmm. residents. But we it had 4.4 million impressions in like a month. We celebrated how, you know, just the fact that they were matching. And then when individuals came to me and said, you know, Kamran, can you please teach us kind of how, what you do? I was like, sure. Again, worst businessman ever. We created a free fellowship. It's called the Digital Communications Fellowship in Pathology. I partnered with the Pathologist Magazine for some legitimacy. And it's a free um, one-year fellowship, which is basically some didactic sessions with experts. We teach them about branding, marketing, social media numbers, um, YouTube, uh, podcasting. Mike Williams helps us with that too. There are, And so we take four or five fellows a year. This year, we took a fifth fellow from Ukraine. Um, and we, you know, they do a capstone project. And then at the end, they get a certificate um, in at one of the annual national meetings, right? That they completed this experience. Um, and, you know, Loyola Pathology kind of supports it as well. So I think that from the perspective of education, this is more than just likes and tweets. This is really creating portfolios for educators as we are, you know, becoming more and more savvy with these types of technologies. I think it's extremely important that we consider how to incorporate these things in promotion packets and how to uh, validate your educators who are going uh, outside the box. It really, like I mentioned before, is the network that does not sleep. I think that uh, it's something to be reckoned with. In HemePath specifically, I think I, these are two papers I was proud to be a part of. I think that, you know, we are call them next-gen scholarship or, you know, social media for HemePath. It can be practice changing. I was discussing, I think, at dinner last night or maybe today, there are places from resource poor, poor parts in the world. I have given virtual lectures to them, approach to leukocytosis, kind of how to recognize APL, how to do all of these things I've been able to do from the comfort of my office. Um, after more, like uh, with my morning coffee during my lunch break, I'm not reimbursed for it. I understand that it doesn't help me make money. It does help the Loyola Pathology brand. It uh, helps, and I don't care about the money. It just helps me be a better person. So I think that there are mechanisms that you can have your own institutional vision and mission, and also a personal vision and mission, and you can run those concurrently. The most recent thing we've started is hemereports.com. This is uh, two hematopathologists. You'll probably recognize with me, Dr. Sanam Lokavi at MD Anderson, and then three hematologists. Two of them are at MD Anderson, and one is at uh, University of Chicago. And we do a monthly case report, right? It's called Heme Reports. It is on Zoom, and uh, actually one was done day before yesterday. It was on blastic plasma cytoid dendritic cell neoplasm. We collect the experts on these diseases and we show a case just like any tumor board would, literally 45 minutes to 50 minutes. They're all free on the website, hemereports.com. I think we're on season two, episode two. We have discussed AML, ALL, MPN, MDS. You can just go there. These are people who have named things and changed the categories of things. And they are literally just sitting in an informal discussion based on a patient talking about something. And this has been incredibly valuable. On YouTube, thousands of people have watched these already. Probably like 100 or 200 tune in live, but then they just watch it online. So please check out Team Reports if that is of interest to you. This is my latest paper. I don't know why it's so small, but it's called hashtag path Twitter. It's like a positive place for medical students. And the reason it's small is because I wanted to animate this. I think that you cannot have your head in the sand anymore. I'm sorry. The older we're getting and the less savvy we're getting with technologies, our younger generation is getting better and better. If you are going to be an institution, and I'm not saying this to you as you guys, I'm just saying if there is going to be an institution that says, oh, we don't care if they're doing Pathoma or whatever or doing it online, we don't care about that. We, you know, we just don't see it. That's not the future. It's going to happen more and more. 
I think the value of medical school will keep going down. Early years of medical school will keep going down. And I think that we'll have to reckon with that. So I think that it's probably best if we recognize what is happening um, in the tr you know in the true way that they are putting together bits and pieces of their education from different sources, all right? And they're piecing it together. So we have a choice. We can either be part of that or we cannot be part of it. And that brings me to bricolage. Bricolage means to construct made think, construction made of whatever materials are at hand, something created from a variety of available things. And they have a lot of things available to them. And my challenge to all of us, myself included, is to make sure that we are part of those available things because without that, we will lose our value even more. So I will end with this slide. Pedagogy, it can be defined in many things. And so if you think of it as a scarf, I really like that. Purpose, imagination, excitement, adventure, resilience, and confidence, whatever, right? Kind of fun words. But if the scarf of pedagogy is being made with those words, I juxtapose these things that social media and digital solutions are now the arms that are kind of holding that together, right? So whether this be active learning, flipped classroom, supplemented learning, virtual learning, asynchronous learning, we have to be savvy in the way we promote this, approach this, and hopefully we can make better informed and better physicians in the future. Thank you. Yes. Very, very good question. So for on the people on Zoom, the question is, do we collect data on um, whether there are special needs learners and which one works better for them? We have not. Unfortunately, I would love to collect that data, especially because the reach of Path Elective is so broad. But I do know that there are papers now that are looking at special needs learners uh, and figuring out things in asynchronous learning about, for example, let's say, uh, are colorblind learners, right? In which color fonts work versus don't work. Are ADHD learners, apparently the, the font that works for them the best is Comic Sans, which makes me shudder because I hate Comic Sans, but I'll do it for you know people who have ADHD. So there are things now that are coming through the pipeline, especially for from DEI efforts that look at those specific things, but we unfortunately have not looked at them. Let me just see if there's like a question on chat. Um, okay, there's a question. There's a question in the chat, but there's also a question. Back. Okay, back with yeah. There's a great presentation. I'm curious in your thoughts and any experience on whether the this aspect needs policing at all, and if so, how in terms of quality and I mean, you set it up yourself on your own time, so to speak, and that's great. But is there a concern that this could grow? Have approach could grow, and now you have content that it's not as good as it should needs to be. Absolutely. Yes, there. So the question is whether there's concern for whether this need, content needs to be uh, policed in a way. I fully agree with you. I think that there's a huge concern that things like this could get out of hand. And that is why I think the idea of putting our heads in the sand as organizations comes to play. Because I would rather, I would rather that these resources be vetted by people who are familiar with LCME-based education and incorporated officially into their curricula. I would rather that a medical school say, okay, everyone is using Pathoma, great. Let me go through Pathoma. We can't ask Hussain Sattar to do it, but I will create a list of objectives and link them to our learning objectives. And I, we will say, sure, as part of your supplementary learning, this is what you need to do from Pathoma because we've vetted it. Because without that, there is no end to this, right? In free resources, the, the, the danger is even more because if it's a free resource, everyone is accessing it. But the danger still exists in paid resources. Then you can access, pay money and access garbage education. So this is a problem. So, so I agree with you that there is a worry and I think appropriate policing is necessary. That said, the saving grace a little bit is that when it is out there for free, I have witnessed the peer review on social media is harsh and it is immediate, right? If I put out a cell and I say, hey, this is a monocyte, okay? 
trust me, I know what a monocyte looks like. But if this is a monocyte that has a little bit of lymphoid features, I will have like a thousand people be like, what you're doing? You don't know what you're talking about, especially the anonymous people. They will become rude. They will become rude. So I'm so in general, that immediate peer review, because people's egos are really high, happens as well. So not that that balances it and it doesn't take away the concern that you raise. I fully agree with you. But I do think that if someone is going to learn, like this is a monocyte, right? And they're going to look at the chat and they'll be like, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about because this is obviously not a monocyte. So there is a mechanism. Specifically in the pathology world, I think it's small enough for us to know who the players are, right? And so I have on occasion, like trainees have put on a case and they have made like a kind of an obvious mistake or, you know, called something a little bit wrong. I have politely gone into their DMs and be like, you should probably take this down because this is not what it is, right? That's one way to do peer review. Another way to do peer review is to retweet and be like, this is garbage and this is BS and don't look at it, right? So you can choose which way you want to do it. But I agree that for policing to occur appropriately, you have to first acknowledge that these things are there. Yes. So um, I apologize if uh, you already mentioned this, but yeah. can I just step out and yeah. love your talk? Yeah. Um, this is fantastic. Thank you. Um, do you have a way to know the efficacy of integrating and making a scarf that looks you know, even more beautiful? I mean, do you have a way to assess, say, the performance yeah. the I mean, some metric that allows you to know how I love your question. So the question for the people on Zoom is about effectivity and measuring effectivity and whether we have a metric for it. The answer is unfortunately, I do not have a metric. The metric would ultimately have been in an ideal world, the metric would have been improvement in step one score, but that's not happening anyway because people are passing. Do I think that my R materials are changing the step pass rate? Probably not. So I think that we can't really answer that question, but I think one way that we're trying to do this is do, and we're working on it right now, is to do case control study of people who have supplemental material and then how they do versus people who didn't have supplemental material and to see if there's a difference. But I agree fully, you must be an educator because this is a, something, you know, from curricular design, I did. The deployment of the educational content I took care of but the assessment is always the issue and the assessor in me dies when I do this. I'm sad that you brought it up and now I've, ex now I've accepted that I failed, but I think for assessment, I agree that I failed in that sense, yeah. Yes. I think what you gave was excellent. I have a very quick question. Is it possible to create a search engine to gather some of the gathering? I love that question. So the question is whether there's an ability to create a search engine for scattered data in social media. So rudimentarily, it exists. And I'll tell you what I do. So when I need to give a lecture now, nationally or locally or regionally, and I want to update some images, I go to, to Twitter. I'm not, this is not an exaggeration. I go to Twitter and I put hairy cell leukemia and I hit enter and I just search. Wherever there's hairy cell leukemia, if I like the image, I'll use it. And then the way I do it is that I just crop the entire tweet with the person who tweeted it, and I just put it there. It's free, free source. The way you can actually make it searchable is by indexing it with the hashtag. So if you have a hashtag, you can that is a searchable thing in, on Twitter and also on Instagram. And so there are hashtags now that are reasonably well used. So for example, there is a hashtag called LUSM, L-E-U-S-M. That's leukemia social media. There is one called L-Y-M-S-M, LIM-S-M. And so those are categorizing any tweet with leukemia social media, lymphoma social media, myeloma social media. And similarly, there's Gyne and you know, Forensics and all of these, like they have their hashtags. But then one way to then search it is to then hashtag the disease diagnosis. So I do it often if I say it's AML, I will typically, wherever I'm saying AML, I will go hashtag AML. So that's one way for me to just find the things I've tweeted about. So I, I will go to Twitter and say, search for K Mirza, hashtag AML, and anything that I've tweeted about AML will come up. And often this happens, and I'll, I'll share an example. When I have PGY1s and I'm talking to them about the normal marrow, sorry, this is a heat path discussion, but basically it applies to everyone. Uh, I always talk about secondary granules and grands and how they come out as a little sunrise, right? I always call it the little sunrise. So I have tweeted about this years ago and I, I tell people at the scope, I'm like, just 
go to Twitter and look for K Mirza and Sunrise. There's only one tweet that should come up. Hopefully, <laughs> that would be really weird if they're like multiple tweets. But it is the it is the tweet where I have like a picture of a sunrise and a picture of a neutral like a neutrophilic precursor with the secondary granules coming out. And I use that to supplement day to day learning because if I can't see the cell, I'll be like, listen, I've tweeted about this. Just look for it, and it works. So it's a rudimentary system. It's indexing, but there's no formal mechanism to search for things. Yeah, yeah. I think we're over time. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. One of them is my thing on here, and then the third one is the Billy Paul right there. Okay, but you've convinced me. Good.